Good evening, all. My name is Essen, and I'm the Surgical Neuro-Oncology Fellow at the Khan University Hospital and member of Pakistan Society of Neuro-Oncology, PASNO. On behalf of PASNO, I welcome you all to this session. PASNO is organizing the Neuro-Oncology webinar series now, and each session in this webinar series will be an hour long and held on alternate Saturdays. During the talk of our guest speaker, all attendees will be muted to enable the speaker to present without any interruption. Questions can be submitted in the chat box and will be answered once the presenter has finished their talk. Attendees can also raise their hands for questions. We will unmute them to speak. This session will be recorded and the link will be shared on the PASNO website. The speaker will take 30 minutes for topic presentation. And after that, there will be an open discussion between our esteemed speaker, panelists, and attendees. The topic of today's session is multimodality treatment for metastatic and primary spine tumors, searching for perfect balance. And today's speaker is Dr. Mark Bilski. It is a need and an introduction. Dr. Mark Bilski is a board certified neurosurgeon at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center and director of Memorial Sloan Kettering's Multidisciplinary Spine Tumor Center. Dr. Bilski completed his MD from Emory University. He pursued his neurosurgical residency at the New York Presbyterian Hospital and Fellowship in Spine Surgery from University of Louisville. He's an author of more than 170 peer-reviewed journal articles and book chapters, and a lead author of the book, Tumors of the Spine. Thank you so much, Dr. Bilski, for joining us today. The floor is yours, sir. It's my privilege. Thank you for the invitation beyond words. And what we're going to share today is really our uh, evolution over the past 25 years and how we started to see metastatic and even primary spine tumors um, very differently from how it had been done um, years ago. And I think um, a lot of this is technology driven and sometimes the technology is different in different countries. And so we'll sort of point out, you know, if the technology is not available potentially, which certainly you have most of this, um, uh, there's still a very meaningful uh, impact on this patient population. Um, it's a massive problem in the metastatic world. 20% of cancer patients will develop spine metastases over the course of their illness, but we've seen an increased number over the past decade, partly as an ascertainment issue, Edmar and FDT have had improved detection, but the systemic treatments have also improved survival, but they're much more effective for visceral than for bone disease, new biologic checkpoint inhibitors. So we think we're gonna see a continued uptick in the number of tumors that we're responsible for. And despite that improved survival, the, the treatment of metastatic spine tumors remains palliative. We wanna improve or maintain neurologic function, achieve local tumor control, mechanical stability, pain relief, and ultimately improve quality of life. And I think this is a home run where you get a patient back to fully functioning, doing what they really love, 100 mile paddle on this river three months after surgery versus this, which is both fixation failure and a radiation recall burn on the back um, that ultimately needed to be fixed with a free flap and extension of hardware. And everything we've done in the past 25 years is to try to avoid the uh, situation of these significant uh, morbidity that's associated with particularly the larger procedures. And we've tried to pare these procedures down to something that's incredibly tolerable for this patient population. Um, far and away, the single greatest advance in the treatment of metastatic disease is not on the surgical side, but really stereotactic radiosurgery. And I would say even as proton beams and carbon ions become available across the world, stereotactic radiosurgery will continue to play a bigger and bigger role uh, as we see these incredibly good outcomes from hypofractionated radiation. Radio surgery is defined as high dose per fraction conformal radiation, often given a 16 to 24 gray single fraction or eight to 10 gray times three fractions. And credit conventional external beam radiation, which is often given as three gray times 10 fractions. Radio surgery obviously has a shorter treatment time, but you could actually give a cytotoxic ablative tumoral dose. And that fundamentally changed our treatment paradigms, including the indications for and type of surgery that we do. Over the past decade, there have been major advances in radio surgery, including technological, defining tumorcidal doses, dose constraints for organs at risk, and even defining the radiobiology of radio surgery. And here's a typical case example of a 66-year-old male, has a history of renal cell carcinoma, has biologic back pain, which just denotes tumor being present for three weeks. He's acute onset of weakness, Asia C, so he's less than three out of five in the lower extremities. He has other issues, chronic renal insufficiency, 
systemic workup shows renal cell extending into the renal vein, pulmonary nodules. And you can see this really high grade circumferential epidural disease at T10. You look at a patient like that, they're just incredibly complicated. And what you need to do is pare it down into decision points that you can make on every patient. That was really integrated into this decision framework that we refer to as GNOMES, neurologic, oncologic, mechanical stability and systemic disease to decide best treatment. I think um, these are always the four sentinel decision points that we go back to, to make decisions about patients. It has evolved over the years and we've got new evidence-based medicines and new technologies that we've integrated, but we always go back to these four sentinel decision points. The neurologic and oncologic considerations are made in combination. From a neurologic perspective, we're very concerned about whether the patient has myelopathy or a functional radiculopathy, but much of the decision-making is based on the degree of epidural spinal cord compression. From an oncologic perspective, what we're really talking about is how we get local tumor control, and that's completely predicated on the radiation response. Radiosensitivity has been completely redefined as we've transitioned from conventional external beam radiation to stereotactic radiosurgery. We have other modalities like P32 plaques to clear dural margins, and high-dose rate of rhythm afterload of catheters for recurrent bone disease. The separate assessment is mechanical instability, right? Because no amount of radiation will stabilize an unstable spine. The SINS criteria was developed to define instability in the neoplastic setting, which is very different from trauma. There are six components to the SINS criteria, all are weighted by their contribution to instability. Location, junctional, mobile spine have a higher point score than semi-rigid or rigid. The pain, yes, is movement-related axial load type pain. Bone lesions are classified as lytic mixed or plastic. Alignment, sub alignment, subluxation, translation has the highest point score, the degree of vertebral body collapse or involvement, and then whether the posterior elements are involved. Those are added together. Zero to six is considered stable. Seven to 12, potentially unstable, and greater than 13, unstable. So here's a patient, very classic with a thoracolumbar burst fracture, SIN score of 10, where you have a burst or compression fracture with severe pain related to that fracture. Those patients are very well treated with kypho or vertebroplasty. And there's class one evidence that patients who are treated with that compared to best medical management have significantly pain, better pain relief at a month and it's durable out to a year. So we're very aggressive with painful Kypho, uh, painful uh, burst or compression fractures that are pathologic. It is very controversial in the osteoporotic literature. It is not controversial uh, in the cancer literature, whether these procedures are meaningful in this population. It turns out that when you get up into that SINS 13 score where patients are grossly unstable, you actually need to give them a posterior tension band. Very classically, they'll have a burst or compression fracture with extension into the posterior elements. You can't simply do a standalone kypho over tiboplasty. They need a posterior tension band, and we typically do that now with percutaneous pedicle screws, short segment with fenestrated PMMA augmented augmentation, as you can see here. So we augment the screws so that we can go short, and we do a kyphoplasty at the index level. And in that series of patients, we had significant pain relief, again, in patients that were not responding well to kypho over tiboplasty, giving them a posterior tension band is very meaningful. And finally, there are patients who need open surgery. This patient with a fracture subluxation at C12, who needs occipitocervical decompression and occipitocervical fixation. The last assessment really is, you make that assessment that they need surgery or even radiation. How sick are they? And does it make sense in the context of their disease? Oftentimes survival is used as a determinant as to whether a patient should go to surgery or even radiation therapy. And it turns out that in the era of biologics and checkpoint inhibitors, we have extended survival for virtually every cancer. And that really put us into a difficult situation because all of a sudden we couldn't predict survival like we could in the era of chemotherapy. Um, and mostly the people at Harvard, Joe Schwab and that group developed nomograms or predictive models in the era of biologic checkpoint inhibitor. They're very accurate in predicting survival, especially at the extremes, those who are gonna live a long time versus those who have a really limited survival. And you can now begin to integrate that into the decision-making. The other thing that's really interesting and really has come to bear over the last two or three years is the treatment of oligometastatic disease with radiation. 
and its impact on survival. The Sabre Comet trial was a prospective randomized trial out of Europe that looked at conventional external beam radiation versus stereotactic radio surgery for up to one to five metastases. And if you gave ablative radio surgery, there's actually a survival advantage. So now that local radiation becomes part of systemic disease control. The PISA trial was our trial, it was bone only. 50% of those patients were um, spine uh, patients. Uh, when we gave an ablative dose of radiation, 24 grade single fraction versus nine grade times three, we had better local tumor control, but we actually had a decrease in distant metastases. So again, we're impacting systemic disease by giving local radiation to the spine tumors. Why do we need a GNOMES framework? Because no tumor looks the same. They all have different issues. And what we really wanted to do is consolidate the decision-making so that across disciplines, radiation, neurosurgery, interventional radiology, we're all working from the same framework. This was one uh, week where we saw 70 patients, 62 patients were evaluated. And if you look across the spectrum of what we saw, they're all so different, but everything fundamentally goes back to that GNOMES framework in terms of decision-making. In terms of the neurologic and oncologic decisions, they're made in combination. From an oncologic perspective, there are radio, radio sensitive tumors to conventional external beam radiation, uh, mostly the hematologic malignancies, myeloma lymphoma, and then the hormone driven solid tumors are fairly radio sensitive. It turns out that the remainder of the solid tumors are relatively radio resistant. And again, from a neurologic perspective, we care a lot about myelopathy, but what we're principally concerned about in a lot of decision making is a degree of epidural spinal cord compression. There's a scoring system that's been validated where zero is bone only, one A, B, and C are different degrees of epidural impingement without spinal cord compression, two is spinal cord compression, CSF scene, three spinal cord compression, no CSF scene, and at least traditionally, the twos and threes have been considered high-grade cord compression. So how do we make decisions? Well, for the sensitive and moderately sensitive tumors, regardless of the degree of cord compression, we're very comfortable sending those patients to conventional external beam radiation, 30 gray and 10. For moderately to highly resistant tumors with bone only or epidural impingement, we typically take those patients straight to stereotactic radiosurgery. And then for moderately to highly resistant tumors with high grade cord compression, traditionally, we've taken them for a very limited separation surgery followed by radiosurgery. More recently, we've started to treat a lot of the grade two compressions with hypofractionated radiation, 24 to 30 grade and three fractions, leaving really only the grade threes moderately to highly resistant tumors for separation surgery followed by radiosurgery. The additional piece of information you need is whether that patient is myelopathic. And once we develop myelopathy, usually in patients with high-grade cord compression, it's really only the sensitive tumors that we treat, the myeloma lymphomas, put them on high-dose steroids, bring them to the hospital, and then treat with radiation. The moderately sensitive tumors that we were very comfortable treating with high-grade cord compression if they were, didn't have myelopathy, once they develop myelopathy, the breast and prostate, we then take them to surgery because you can't decompress the spinal cord quickly enough with radiation alone to get recovery of function. So for moderately sensitive tumors and the remainder of the solid tumors, which are moderately to highly resistant with myelopathy, we go to separation surgery followed by radiosurgery. And then this is the patient who comes into your emergency room in the middle of the night with high grade cord compression and they have no history of cancer and you have no idea what that tumor is. And I will tell you that our default in those patients is take them to surgery and get them out of trouble. If it's myeloma lymphoma, even though you'll get a good response to radiation, you don't have the leeway or the time to actually make that diagnosis. Go ahead and take them for a limited surgery, get them out of trouble, and then get them to effective therapy afterwards. Why do we think that's true? Because patients who come in that are even subtly myelopathic, Asia D, will often follow, uh, fall right off the cliff. So they may be a D one day, but even on high dose steroids with high grade compression, oftentimes within a day or two, they're a C and then paralyzed. And so there is a window of opportunity to get them treated. You don't wanna wait for a diagnosis to determine whether it's radio sensitive to get that patient out of trouble and get neurologic recovery. What do we know about radio sensitivity conventional external beam radiation? There was very little in the literature that looked at differential radio sensitivity based on tumor histology. But what's there was consistent. There are these radiosensitive tumors, again, hematologic breast and prostate versus the radio resistant tumors, which are completely or largely resistant. Although oftentimes, you know, you can get a response. It's just not durable. Um, and that's a problem 
especially as patients begin to live longer, you need more durable control. Here's a patient with multiple myeloma, right? Really high grade compression, Asia C, put them on hydrosteroids, gave three grade times 10, re-imaged at the end of radiation. You can see the tumor completely apoptose, decompressing the spinal cord. The problem is you never see those responses in the radioresistant tumors. And so for patients with millenose spinal cord compression with radioresistant tumor histologies, where we have a target for radiation, we'll go straight to stereotype radiosurgery. And there is a plethora of data on good outcomes using radiosurgery. Here's our series from Memorial of a little over 800 tumors with radioresistant tumor histologies treated for ESCC score zero to one C at a median follow-up of um, a little over two years. The prescription dose was 18 to 26 gray single fraction, but dose was analyzed continuous variable. Optimal cut point was used to establish a low versus high dose cohort. The median dose planning target volume in the low dose cohort was 16.4 gray versus the high dose cohort, 22.4 gray. The only significant factor in the incidence of local failure was the dose of radiation. In the low dose cohort at a year, we still did great. We only had a 5% failure rate, which is obviously significantly better than conventional external beam radiation. But again, these patients are living longer. And at four years, we had a 20% failure rate. In the high dose cohort at a year, we had uh, less than 1% failure rate. But at four years, we had given an ablative dose of radiation. We really saw no recurrences, 2.1%. So 98% local control based on 24 gray single fraction. And what happened is, right, you overcome radio resistance with high dose per fraction radiation. So there was no significant impact of histology. It didn't matter with breast or prostate versus colon or non-small cell or renal cell carcinoma. We overcome radio resistance with high dose per fraction radiation. And how did that change our treatment paradigms? Here's a patient with a T10 solitary renal cell metastases. If you go to classic um, uh, scoring systems that, that determine treatment, the Tamita Takahashi scores, the recommendation would be for on block resection, which is cancer metastatic population particularly is prohibitively oftentimes uh, morbid. They just can't tolerate these long operations with massive blood loss. With radio surgery, right, treatment times are, are really short. Uh, uh, we have limited morbidity, and then we have local control upwards of, of 98%. And then we may get that additional benefit, right? of decreasing the probability of distant metastases. So largely for those tumors where we have a target, even for oligometastatic or solitary tumors, we're basically going to radio surgery over on block. Now, if you don't have a big radio surgery program or you don't have access to it, is it okay to do an on block resection in patients where you can get a margin? The answer is yes, but you really have to consider the morbidity and whether that patient will tolerate the procedure because realistically, you will get short-term durable control with conventional radiation, and that may be a better gig than putting somebody with metastatic disease through a non-block resection. Much of the last decade has been uh, used to define dose constraints for organs at risk. The most important by far is to the spinal cord, and a cord D max, a point dose on the cord of 14 gray, we have one, less than 1% chance of creating myelitis, but it is that dose constraint to the cord that really prevents us from treating high grade cord compression with radio resistant tumors and why we still go to surgery for those patients. Much of that's still predicated on the Patchell study published Lancet 2005. It's a prospective randomized trial of solid tumors looking at high grade cord compression with myelopathy, comparing surgery and conventional external beam to conventional external beam alone. And in every outcome variable, surgery was better than radiation alone. And based on that, and a number of other studies, the Spine Oncology Study Group made a strong recommendation that patients with high-grade cord compression due to solid tumor malignancy undergo surgical decompression stabilization followed by radiation therapy. And the question became, right, what kind of surgery and what kind of radiation? As we began to integrate radio surgery as a post-operative adjuvant, the goals of spinal cord decompression for neurologic salvage and using screw rod systems for mechanical stability remain the same. What changed for us was the oncology, right? How we get local tumor control is completely predicated on the radiation response. So when we use conventional external beam radiation therapy, we used to do much more aggressive resections, maximally cytoreductive, either gross total or on block, but with radio surgery, maybe the only true goal had to be to reconstitute the thecal sac to create a better target for radiation. And that became known as separation surgery. 
Um, it's a really simple procedure uh, and relatively quick. It's really a, an instrumented fusion. Classically, it was two levels above and below the index level. We take a high-speed drill and drill off all the bone above and below where the epidural disease is. We take out the superior and inferior facet joint and take out the medial part of the pedicle and then strip the tumor from normal dural margins. And ultimately, you need to take out the PLL uh, to affect the margin on the anterior dura. And ultimately, what we're trying to do is reconstitute the thecal sac to create a better safe target for radiosurgery. Now, you can be as aggressive as you want with taking out the tumor, but the ultimate and really fundamental goal is to reconstitute the thecal sac to create a better target. And additionally, right, your obligation as a neurosurgeon is if you have high-grade cord compression and myelopathy, you're going to do that anyway, right? You have to get them effectively decompressed. Why do we like separation surgery? Um, and even before we had radio surgery, we had largely abandoned anterior approaches for metastatic disease. And there were a lot of reasons for that. One is that the operative times are often uh, longer with the anterior approach, especially if you had to back them up. So there's short operating times with separation surgery. You can do an emergency operation for epidural tumor without having to get an access surgeon. And then you can do these very large multi-compartmental tumors without having to worry about all this paraspinal disease, right? If you come from an anterior approach, you have to get through all that paraspinal disease just to get to where you fundamentally want to be, which is in the epidural space to decompress them for neurologic salvage. The other thing is if we come from a posterior approach, right, we have a much better chance of identifying normal dural margins. We always know where the spinal cord is and the normal uh, dural planes. Again, if we come from the front, we hope that we find the dura before we're in it. If we come from the back, we always know where the normal dura is and where the spinal cord is. We're always pushing tumor away from the spinal cord. Um, and then, you know, you can extend for multi-level decompressions. It's not hard to do that. It's very hard for an anterior approach. So we can treat this contiguous multi-level epidural disease. Um, the other problem is that the approaches for anterior and the cancer population are complicated. Partly you have to mobilize critical structures. Oftentimes people have already had operations there. So things get tethered down like the esophagus on an anterior cervical approach. Um, and then oftentimes they have medical comorbidities and simply can't tolerate a thoracotomy. So this posterior approach has largely been a godsend for us. Here's what happens in the reduction of morbidity, right? Here's a 45 year old that actually had a primary low grade kind of sarcoma. Um, we did an anterior approach through this uh, transmandibular osteotomy. That's a very morbid procedure in a primary tumor, let alone in somebody with metastatic cancer. Um, they need to be pegged and trached for at least two weeks after this procedure. We did occipital cervical fixation, and somehow we decided that they needed an anterior column support here, which in reality at C1C2, there is no uh, load to the anterior column. They really simply need a posterior fixation, but this was kind of in vogue at the time. You can see we actually got a robust fusion posteriorly along that segment, uh, but at uh, seven years, we were looking at them through the mouth at this cage, and they ended up having to have a massive esophageal reconstruction. And I can tell you, he had dysphagia from day one and was miserable from the day he had this operation. Um, he's still alive. We have good tumor control, but the tumor control was really from the radiation, not from aggressive resection. Here's encounter distinction. This is a 33-year-old female who came in. She'd had multiple resections for uterine tumors, finally got pregnant. She tripped on an airplane jetway um, and became acutely quadriplegic and came into the hospital with this really high-grade compression at C12. Um, and because she was paralyzed, had this new tumor, um, but you know, again, was pregnant, there was no way we were going to go through an anterior approach. So we really did just simple separation surgery to reconstitute the thecal sac and then did occipital cervical fixation. By the grace of goodness, because she was young and healthy, she recovered to hand numbness at two months and then uh, was completely neurologically normal. So she went from paralyzed with a good decompression fixation to recovery of function. This ended up being a low-grade lyomyosarcoma. At the time, we weren't treating sarcoma uh, with a hypofractionated radiation, but she went to... Um, sarcoma type doses using uh, photon beam image guided radiation. The baby was uh, delivered uh, at about six months and she's now uh, 14 years old. This is a tumor we left behind after separation surgery, right? We left all this tumor behind. 
here's her 10 year follow up film, right? It's not about the amount of tumor you take out. It's about the response to radiation that ultimately gives you tumor control. Um, I don't really have time to talk about the primary tumors, but suffice it to say that chordoma is equally as radiosensitive as any other solid tumor. And so we've begun to integrate radiosurgery into our treatment paradigms for these patients. Here's a 54 year old female had this high cervical myelopathy, so clumsy hand syndrome, got a needle biopsy, we knew it was chordoma. And because we didn't think we could get this tumor out anteriorly, certainly not with wide or even marginal margins, all we did was an epidural decompression occipital cervical fixation, essentially separation surgery, with the intent that we would give this patient radiation 24 gray single fraction, um, and then um, take her back through a transmandibular resection to resect that residual disease that was inevitably gonna be there. So we took this patient for the simple separation surgery, and you can see we reconstituted the fecal sac uh, and occipital cervical fixation, and then gave 24 gray single fraction. And what happened, we were following this patient with the intent to go back, and then we had this massive response right to the radiation. And here's the seven-year follow-up film, right, with no evidence of residual recurrent tumor. So again, it was about the response to radiation. You look at the chordoma like this, there's no way to unblock this to get margin. So it's sort of a fallacy to think that you could even do it. We have bilateral vertebral artery involvement uh, and then this massive paraspinal tumor and then we have epidural abutment. So there is no possibility. So the intent to do an on-block resection for the sake of it made no sense. We got neurologic recovery. We stabilized across that segment. We got under radiation and we got tumor control. What's changed in separation surgery recently is that traditionally in the thoracic and lumbar spine, we were doing long segment fixation after the surgery. And the, the reason we did that was to distribute the load in osteoporotic bone, but also oftentimes if they progress disease, it was at adjacent segment. And then you'd lose all fixation if you were short segment. With the addition of these PMMA augmented fenestrated pedicle screws, we now have the ability to go short segment uh, on these patients. And so for most separation surgery now, we're not doing long fixation. We're going one level above and below with cement augmentation. We looked at the fixation failure rate on the long constructs after separation surgery. We had a 2.8% failure rate that required a reoperation. With this short segment PMMA augmented pedicle screws, the number of patients that require reoperation are very similar. So we think we're overcoming that osteoporosis and the potential um, for uh, adjacent segment progression, uh, ruining your hardware, pulling out screws, et cetera, with the cement augmentation. And largely we've abandoned long constructs uh, in separation surgery. And now we're doing uh, a number of tubular retractor resections, these really uh, limited uh, uh, decompressions through tubes that again, we hope will continue to reduce the morbidity from this operation. In terms of separation surgery, 75% of our non-ambulatory patients regain the ability to walk, and overall 90% were ambulatory. In terms of tumor control, if you did really aggressive surgery followed by conventional external beam radiation, there's only a 30% uh, local control at a year, so 70% recurrence. If you live long enough, everybody recurred, and the biggest predictor of recurrence, right, was tumor histology. If you had radio-resistant tumor histology, you weren't going to get control no matter how aggressive you were with your surgery. With this really simple approach of separation surgery followed by radiosurgery, we looked at 186 patients. Uh, most were operated for high-grade cord compression with radio-resistant tumor histologies. 50% had already failed prior radiation. The one-year cumulative of recurrence was 16%, but if we gave a high enough dose single fraction or high dose hypofractionated radiation, we have less than 10% recurrence in a year. And again, there's no association with radio-resistant tumor histology. We overcome radio-resistance with high-dose perfraction radiation. In terms of patient-reported outcomes in patients undergoing separation surgery, uh, both in terms of pain and general activity, they have significant improvement. And then with a minimal access surgery, similarly, we see very good pain improvement uh, and improvements in general activity. And I think, again, as we get less invasive, uh, less morbidity associated with those procedures. So if we do our gnomes approach, um, patients with radiosensitive tumors, regardless of the degree of spinal cord compression, you can still treat with conventional external beam radiation. And again, the exception being breast and prostate with myelopathy, we do take them to surgery. For radio-resistant tumors with middle nose spinal cord compression, 
ideally you take those patients to high dose stereotactic radio surgery. For radio resistant tumors with high grade cord compression, with or without myelopathy, we're taking them for separation surgery, followed by radio surgery. The separate assessment is, right, if they're unstable, they need a stabilization procedure, kyphoverteroplasty, perk screws, or open surgery. And finally, everything is predicated on what they can tolerate from a systemic disease point standpoint, expected survival, medical comorbidities, extended disease. We go back to that 66-year-old with a history of renal cell, this biologic back pain, which denotes tumor being present, Asia C, chronic renal insufficiency, stomach workup, again, showing renal cell and the renal vein and pulmonary nodules with this high-grade circumferential vertebral disease in the renal cell domain, high-grade cord compression uh, with uh, myelopathy. Um, they're mechanically stable to SIN score of four, and medically, we're clear to do anything we want. This patient is definitely surgical. We're gonna put them on high-dose steroids. Renal cell is massively hypervascular. We're gonna do a preoperative embolization. And then we're gonna take them for really simple separation surgery and then follow them up with radio surgery to get local tumor control. If the same patient has lymphoma with high-grade cord compression and myelopathy, the probability is we're gonna put them on high-dose steroids um, admit them to the hospital to make sure that as we initiate radiation, they don't decompensate. But classically, even in the setting of myelopathy, myeloma and lymphoma will go straight to radiation therapy. And finally, again, that unknown where you don't know what the pathology is and you don't have time to figure it out, take them for simple separation surgery, get them out of trouble, and then get them to effective therapy afterwards. Future directions for us are kind of interesting. I think certainly uh, we're trying to get less invasive um, in the surgical domain. I think in terms of um, where we're going with the radiation, we've kind of peaked on determining optimal um, treatment doses. And now we're trying to do combination therapy, uh, certainly with VEGF TKIs with radiosurgery for tumors like renal cell, we think there's a radiosensitization that will allow us to reduce the radio, uh, dose of radiation. And then uh, the combination of, uh, of checkpoint inhibitors and radiation for local disease control, uh, particularly for tumors that are either immunogenic or particularly for chordoma, which has a lot of PDL1 receptors. Uh, seems to be a very effective strategy, again, for lowering the dose for big volume tumors and getting a significant impact. Um, and then on the basic science side, we're really interested in defining uh, both the immune landscape of bone tumors and the tumor mutation profile to see if we can't begin to impact the biology uh, on that side as well, in addition to um, the radiation. And I think there's a lot of really interesting data that we have submitted and that's coming out uh, in the near future. So with that, I'm going to stop, and I would just love to have a discussion about anything that's important to, to you all. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Bilski, for such an excellent talk. Professor Inam, I would like to ask for your comments. Oh, I'm, I'm, this, was, this was a great talk. I'm just speechless. <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> uh, it, it, things look so much simpler now when we move away from the unblock resection. I, I used to operate with uh, um, Chris Shaffrey. And, you know, Chris Shaffrey is like twice my height. So <laughs> I could, so, so I could uh, get a get two steps up to get up to his height. But then, you know, I could not do anything to get my arms as long as his arms. And he would take a cob and he would like pull this up here and pull this up there. And then, hey, look, right. this is how you do it. And then Russ Knuckles was also, also a tall guy. So, you know, I always felt very intimidated by the <laughs> spine surgery for, for cancer. Short guy, we need to stick together, I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 yeah, so, so this is great. I mean, you know, I, I, it's, it's something that, that is there and you, I kept thinking about it, uh, but, you know, I was not aware of it in this uh fine detail and, and established like as you have done with the you know separation surgery and all the all the numbers and data and it's like it's it's so obvious that uh, this is what we should have been doing for last uh, four or five decades um, you know focusing on on these things 
It's just that I moved away from this stuff and became more and more conservative. So, so I think this is great. Uh, this is great, and we need to uh, look at it from our perspective uh, in 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 a, in a low middle income country uh, perspective also, because um, it's definitely going to save a lot of socioeconomic stress on the patients. I think that's right. I think that's exactly where this went. I think as we got less invasive and integrated radiation, two things happened. One is it was less morbid and people got back either to systemic therapy or to their lives in ways that they wouldn't with these more aggressive approaches. The second thing we realized was that you cannot, you know, no matter how aggressive you are with surgery, there, there's no impact on that tumor biology. So the ability to use radiosurgery to control the disease rather than on block resection, right? The intent with on block was let's get a wide margin. And in metastatic disease, especially stuff that is in the epidural space or big paraspinal, there is no possibility of getting an on block that's actually going to control the disease. You're going to leave something behind. And then the recurrence is wholly dependent on the biology of that tumor, how aggressive it is. The only way you impact the biology, right, is either with radiation or systemic. And it turns out systemic is not very good for bone tumors. And so we have, you know, the radiation evolved to the point where you could safely give an ablative dose up to an ESCC2 score, you know, even where you had cord compression. And then you don't, what, what does it do for a community? It, it means that that patient doesn't come back with recurrent tumor. It means that they get up and walk for the remaining, you know, God willing forever, but, you know, you know, for the, for the time that they have, they have much better quality of life. And then for the oncologist, it gets them back to, you know, systemic treatment really quickly, which is, you know, in this day and age that we actually have effective therapy is critical. So thank you. Yeah. We're, we're of like mind on that. I, I mean, uh, so I, you know, the, the picture that you showed in your first uh, slide with the, with those instruments coming out, that was exactly what I had when I, uh, that was, I think, Russ Knuckles. The year was 1994, and uh, you know, I remember, and that 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 just sort of brought me uh, that those memories back, how the yeah. how the hardware is coming out, popping out, and and things fail. So no, thank you very much. So uh, uh, you know, uh, yes, uh, doctor, so before uh, we even get the questions, I can ask this Dr. Chohan if he wants to, you know, add something. He can give this well, talk. A... You know that you didn't need me for the talk. You, you know that, right? <laughs> I'm a I'm a product of uh, uh, of Dr. Bilski's uh, uh, teaching. Um, I will um, I've I've been very very fortunate, very very fortunate um, to have trained with him and um, uh, and the colleagues at at Sloan Kettering. Um, during my residency, I um, I was doing exactly what uh, Dr. Nam was just uh, alluding to bigger sections, um, big, big time blood loss. And for me, it was an eye opener when I moved to New York and learned all of this. And then I came back to New Mexico and we started actually a program there. Uh, Dr. Bilski was uh, still is very kind. I often send him um, uh, uh, cases to get his opinion, to get his advice. Um, and it was, uh, it, it really, it really started to flourish. The problem with, um, with setting up a program um, uh, of a multidisciplinary program is really radiation oncology. You need to have somebody in radiation oncology who, who has a buy-in uh, with you and can be your partner. And if you don't have that person, uh, this, you know, you can be the greatest surgeon in the world. It's just not gonna work. Um, what do you think, Dr. Bilski? I, I think that's the crucial point. I think the radiation was such a paradigm shift for them that it, it almost takes a generation to get them trained in radio surgery, but every single treatment um, disease management team, every single histology now, basically, whether it's lung, certainly prostate, um, um, are going to hypofractionated radiation with the same techniques we're using for spine. So that next generation will all be trained to do this. And then it's a much easier, you know, so much of, we didn't know anything when we started. We had no idea what dose or dose constraints were. And people in different institutions really um, had different ideas. We had different reporting for cord constraints. You know, it was 10 graded 10% or a cord D max. What the last decade did was really consolidate and made it consistent, both in reporting. And then, um, you, you know, everybody is, is using the same um, uh, contouring guidelines. So all that stuff had to be worked out. 
constraints for organs at risk. You know, we had the benefit of, of having a multidisciplinary clinic where everybody was looking at the same films every day. So when we got complications, we saw them right away. We had the best radiologist in the world looking at every single film. And then we could start to troubleshoot and make, make changes. The benefit that people have now coming out who want to do this is most of those parameters have been defined. We know what doses are. We know what the cord constraints are and the other organs at risk. And now you can begin to disseminate that as a package. And if you're 50 years old and you've been doing conventional radiation for your whole career, there's no way you're going to embrace this. You can continue to do that. And it's fine, right? It's just not optimal for patient outcomes or patient care. And so, I mean, I, I completely agree with you. I think radiation has been the more difficult sell. The converse is this next generation going forward, it's a much easier sell because it's not, you know, we were, it wasn't me, it was Josh Yamada, who you know well, they were mavericks. They really had to work hard to figure it out. And, uh, uh, but we've, we've done that and it's all out in the literature. And I think now you can begin to, to see these programs blossom. You know, and some people have come to, somebody came to me yesterday and said, you know, you know, our, our radiation oncologists won't treat the core D max of 14 gray. And it's like, well, the data is there, but there's less than a 1% chance of myelitis. And really, if you go back and look at those cases, there were probably some contouring or some errors or, you know, whatever. Um, but, you know, it's that next generation that will say the core D max is 14 gray. There's no question about it. And I think that, you know, yeah, it's just, you're, but you're right. It's been radiation. It's been the tougher cell. How do you, um, how do you deal with um, oligometastatic disease with skip lesions? Like you have a high grade cord compression, maybe down at the um, thoracolumbar spine, and then you have, you know, a segment of a good looking spine, bone only disease. And then at upper thoracic spine, you have. So do you do that in a single go, or do you, um, do you separate it with two different constructs? Oh. Um, so they need surgery. So um, yeah, I, I think as we've gone short segment, we've, we, we used to do the long construct and if they had T7, T10, we would bridge that whole gap. Now, right. because we, you know, I, I think the benefit of short segment in addition to putting cement there, so we don't have screw pull out, we don't have haloing, those are kind of rare. Um, but the other thing we're not doing is, is bending a rod, right? Which puts fatigue on the rod and probably increases the likelihood of fracture ultimately of the rod. And so um, I think there's a benefit to that. What we're seeing though, um, long-term is somehow the new stress on that, on that screw is at the tulip screw interface. So you're starting to see the, the screws. So we've had, only because we had two in the last you know, month, those long-term consequences um, we have to sort of troubleshoot because if we're not getting an arthrodesis, which most of them do not, something's eventually going to give. We just hope it's at four years and not at a year. And so we're going back to the companies and saying, you know, you, you took a regular pedicle screw with whatever stresses those were and you put some holes in it. You know, you got to shore up that, that interface because that's where we're seeing the problems. And we, these are happening at like two, three years. We need to be six, seven years because people are living so long with these constructs. But yeah, if we have discontinuous disease now, I, I'm doing a complications course this afternoon. Uh, we were T7, T12. We had two short constructs. We didn't bridge it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. We can, have we questions? Can, but, yes, sir, we have, we have, sir. So we can start. So we have Dr. Rajesh Balakrishnan, and he wants to ask a question and he will ask himself, sir, I, you can unmute yourself. Then we'll take more questions. Dr. Rajesh? Uh, yeah, good evening, Dr. Bilski. It's a very nice talk, very lucid talk. Uh, it clarified a lot of my doubts. I have two questions. What will be your time duration between your surgery and when you will send the patient for heart? Usually here, our surgeons, they're very afraid. They say, at least we need to give a gap of two to four weeks time, at least. Yeah, so that's a great question. I, I think with radio surgery, particularly because you can contour the beams to avoid the operative corridor. And from the time that you are done with the surgery until you get radiation, you're sort of dependent on the biology of that tumor, whether it's gonna recur or not. So what we have done now is we simulate the patient in-house postoperatively. So they get their SIM films and 
um, the contours are done that week, the dose planning is done, and usually they come back at 10 to 14 days. And there's definitely with radiosurgery, no penalty for going early on the radiation. We're not seeing wound complications um, from that. But I think they also make a very intentional, um, uh, intentional intent to, to spare the operative quarter. So they bring these beams in not straight this way, but you know, multiple different dimensions without going through the wound. So I think that's helped a lot, but we um, definitely try to get them within um, two weeks. We often take out staples at three weeks, and I would say 90% of the patients that come back have finished radiation by the time they come back at three weeks. Okay, one more question. Does the type of process is what you use? Will it matter in the time duration? Suppose you have a, uh, a pro implant that is made up of a steel or an aluminum versus a... Uh, titanium processes, what do you use? So um, steel is kind of out both for imaging and for radiation because there's a lot of shielding on the stainless. Um, titanium, there's about a 3% shielding on the radiation um, and we have very good um, MR algorithms to subtract out the artifact. So titanium, there's no penalty either on um, imaging or on the radiation delivery, the 3% um, shielding they can account for in their dosimetry. And with the newer iterations of radiation, um, which are like volumetric arc therapy, they can really overcome, you know, where the hardware is. So we're not really afraid of using certainly titanium screws and rods. As you get into protons and carbon ions, um, that's really where people are starting to use peak, uh, principally and, um, peak, um, uh, for, for photon therapy, probably at this point isn't overly meaningful, uh, but definitely protons and carbon ions, even with titanium, uh, you know, these charged particles sort of bounce off the hardware and you really can't control your dose anymore. And so I think that's where the real utility of that comes in. Um, people were using a lot of cobalt chromium um, and there again, there's a 9% shielding on the radiation. So it's really not optimal if you're gonna radiate. Uh, so basically, we're the titanium, certainly for photons, and, and now we're trending towards peak for, for uh, protons and, and the people who are doing carbon ions uh, as post-operative adjuvant. Thank you, Dr. Bilski. My privilege. So I think Dr. Zain also has a good... Would you like to ask yourself, Dr. Zain, or you want me to read the question? Okay. Thank you, Asin. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bilski, for your talk. I just wanted to ask you about the separation surgery. Do you think we as juniors Dr. should Zane, be using block? Dr. Zain, if you can kindly uh, tell uh, uh, us where you are currently. So oh, yeah, sorry, sorry. Uh, I'm currently working in uh, Birmingham, Queen Elizabeth, Birmingham. And we, we are actually quite a end block heavy unit. So we do quite a lot of end block surgery still. And actually, my question was because of that, do you think it's a skill that we as juniors should be learning still with the separation surgery being one of the one of the new concepts and much easier to do? I, I think for for metastatic disease, if you have access to radio surgery, there's no utility in on block. So I think for, you know, I think for that indication, if you're learning it for METs and that's your principal referral, um, I think that's over. I think if you have radio surgery, I think the days of that truly are done. Um, and it it made sense in the era before we had effective radiation. Um, and now it just for all kinds of reasons, it doesn't make sense. For primary bone tumors, it's a much more complicated and evolving story. And I didn't show the data on chordoma, but our data on chordoma um, is that um, if you can give an ablative dose of radiation, which is 24 gray, single fraction, is ablative for chordoma. We did a series of 34 patients that we looked at, uh, a half were sacrum, half were mobile spine. In the patients who had, um, and a third of the patients got it as definitive radiation with no surgery, a third got either intralesional gross total or separation surgery, and a third got neoadjuvant followed by on block, mostly for sacrum. And it turned out it didn't matter what surgery they got or whether they got surgery, it only mattered what the dose of radiation was. And that was 24 gray. And the ability in chordoma, especially the bigger tumors where you have a lot of extra compartmental extension is 
they're like sarcomas. They have this microscopic penumbra all over. And if you think you can account for that with surgery, you can't. And that's why, you know, a lot of people go into combination, the neoadjuvant radiation. And we're looking at those patients now. And carbon ion in Japan, they've been doing sacral chordoma with carbon ions alone. They have 85% five-year local tumor control. Uh, Stephanie Boriani, who is our champion on on block and brilliant, has completely abandoned on block resection for chordoma. So I think, you know, for what is a one in a million disease, and we don't think there's a lot of utility, I think, you know, technically it's a lovely operation. In terms of oncology, it's kind of meaningless at this point. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wilski. My yes, privilege. I definitely thank remember you. Boriani uh, going around. That, I mean, that's, that's back like about 10 years ago, right? There was a lot of, uh, discussion on that one uh, so Stefan is, Stefan is my best friend I, I adore him right. and we had had this discussion like 15 years ago and we started to see the utility of radio surgery and he came back because he's doing a lot of peak stuff now mm. and he said you know you were right 10 years ago we just couldn't hear it. and it wasn't that I was right it was just we were in a big cancer center we saw these patients it wasn't like there was anything magical we just had a different experience uh, yeah. Uh, so, so before Dr. Altaf asks you, I just wanted to ask uh, Dr. Balakrishnan, where is he from? Because uh, it's good to have people coming from different part of the world. Dr. Balakrishnan, uh, can you introduce yourself a little bit? Uh, you're mute. Yes. Yeah, Dr. Inam, I am a radiation oncologist. I am from uh, Christian Medical College, Belur. It's in southern ah. part of India, very close right. to Chennai. Right. So and basically, I. I'm a self-specialized radiation oncologist. I treat breast and uh, neuro oncology and pediatric radiation oncology. So wow. our center, we have four linear actors and we have near about 12 consultants and postgraduates near about eight postgraduates per year. So big center. It is, it is a very impressive institution. I know that. All right. Thank you very much for- uh, Thank you. Uh, Asan, back to you, buddy. Yes, Mr. Yeah. Dr. Fozan also asked a question, but the same question Dr. Rajesh asked. So Dr. Dolsky has already answered that question. So I'll go to Dr. Alta. They were not. They were not listening to the lecture. So you know, you know. <laughs> no, Fozan for, 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 and Rajesh are my were my residents, so I can say that. <laughs> right. So Fozan is in UK now, and Rajesh is in Dubai. So all right, go ahead. Sorry. Yes, please. Okay, Dr. Alta. Yes, excellent talk and uh, very well organized program. So my, uh, I'm a very introduction, Dr. Altaf, your uh, so My name is Dr. Altaf Ali, which is obviously on the screen. And I'm a neurosurgeon in Pakistan and I have been friends with the Professor Atari now at our Khan University Hospital, where I'm currently working as well. So my question was related to the upfront radiation on uh, radiation therapy to the patients in metastatic cancers. When do you advise without going for any surgical intervention upfront radiation therapy in metastatic cancers? So, so with no surgery, is that? Yeah. No surgery. Yeah. yeah, I think I think if you have a target for radio surgery, meaning you don't have cord compression. Um, we, and, and no instability, we're taking them straight to radiation with no, with no um, surgical intervention. I, I think that the, the one downside, you know, if you irradiate bone, especially thoracolumbar junction, there's about a 40% risk of fracture, right? From, and so the question is always, do you need to prophylactically treat those? And we do not do that. It turns out that only that's a radiographic fracture rate. Only 7% of those patients actually needed, you know, kyphoma over T-roplasty or perk screws. Um, and so I think that would be the only utility. But for the ESCC 0 to 1C and now even 2s, we're mostly going straight to radiation with no surgery. All right. Great. Great. I have another question here. So, so Dr. Bolsky, how often do you use SIN score? So... It's for every case, every tumor case in the spine that you deal with, same scoring system. Yeah, I, you know, I, I think it was a marvelous way to codify what we were seeing. And it's not perfect. But yeah, basically everybody, you know, the, the two questions you have to ask, right? I mean, 
we could do all this gnome stuff, but the reality is that, the, the, you know, if you're a surgeon, the two things you want to know are, is do you have high grade port compression with a radio resistant tumor and are they unstable? So everybody that comes in gets basically a SIN score, or SIN's assessment. Do we actually go through the, you know, scoring them to make a determination? No, but you know, if they have a burst compression fracture and bad pain, we're thinking about kypho vertebroplasty, their burst compression, post element disease and bad pain, they're gonna get a kyphoplasty and perk screws. And so I think, you know, what, what, what SINs really did, what, what was happening, right, was, was in some centers, every burst fracture, whether it was painful or not, whether it settled, was an unstable fracture, right? And that's not right. That's, you know, that, you don't need to treat every fracture um, just because it fractured in the bone. And the other side of it is people are completely missing, mostly on the radiation oncology side was, right, you have like, you know, a, a C12, you know, five millimeter fracture sublux with severe movement related pain. You should not radiate that patient. There has to be a mechanism for you to put them into the unstable category and get them treated. And that's really what SINs did was gave people at least a gestalt, uh, 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 you know, a sort of global picture of what instability was. And the reason it's different, like trauma, the difference is really fundamentally is in trauma, you shear ligaments, right? So there's a different kind of instability in those. In cancer, you never shear ligaments. It's all bony destruction, malalignment, you know, bad joint that when you move, it hurts. And when I look at instability, it's kind of that sense of, I, we use SINs and we care about the radiographic criteria. We care a whole lot about their pain criteria. But realistically, the question you're asking, right, is if I irradiate this, is this pain going to get better? Or this is pure fracture pain that no matter what I do with radiation, it's not going to get better. And if you kind of couch it that way, it kind of helps you get there. But I think, you know, there's a recognition that instability in cancer was different from trauma or degen. Um, and, and that was just a way to codify it. And it's pretty good. Um, you know, globally, I think, but as a surgeon, you have to make that assessment because, you know, it used to be, we only operate on high grade core compression and myelopathy. And then this whole thing came in is like, well, but they're unstable, right? It's a different problem in cancer that you're also responsible for. So. All right. Thank you. You know, I, I'm, can I, can I say something? I'm thinking that, um, this, this whole concept is not really so popular, uh, in this part of the world. And I wonder whether a, something like a twinning program, uh, we, we can have, you know, like for example, uh, Dr. Bilski, we can have you, Umar, we can have you in that. And, you know, maybe, you know, AKU is the main institution in Pakistan that can be part of it. Maybe, you know, even, even Christian Medical Center in, uh, in Valor, they can join. So, so if, if somehow we can have this uh, international tumor board, a spine tumor board, that will make it popular in this part of the world uh you know the problem would be that when a patient comes to you with a problem we can't wait a month uh, but then we can in retrospect we can look at the cases and get educated and then once it gains uh, enough popularity uh this the word will spread out uh, we're all i'm all in i think the other thing that's really effective is we we should disseminate uh you know we we do a lot of of review online Mm -hmm. So somebody will just send the case and say, you know, just what would you do? It's not necessarily you have to do it, but, you know, we can do those opinions almost in real time, too. And I'm so happy to do that. We can definitely do tumor boards because it gets, you know, everybody globally thinking on the same page. Absolutely. And, and with tumor boards, you know, everybody sees those cases. And so, I mean, you spend a lot of time probably giving those reviews, but that's one on one. And in a tumor board, it's like, you know, so many people and it may build up. Umar, what, what are your thoughts, buddy? No, it's uh, uh, it's it's very it's very important. Um, what I realized uh, that I was not, um, you know, w once I finished my training with Dr. Bilski uh, and went back, I realized that you know people even in the you know, even in the United States, um, if you take out the coasts, um, uh, you know they are, you know, if you, if you go outside of the main medical centers, university-based centers, people are not aware. People are still living, you know, 50, 60 years ago. Uh, people do not know how to distinguish between mechanical pain and biological pain. I didn't know, Dr. Bilski taught me. And that was, I mean, it's when you think about this whole concept that um, uh, Bilski and his team has, has created, it's really very commonsensical. It's looking at you in the face and you just can't, you know, if somebody just points it out, you're like, wow, this, I should have known it long time ago. 
I mean, that's that's the way I was feeling. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right. I, that's because yeah. I'm not that smart. I just I have a lot of <laughs> So 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 it looks like Rajesh is in. Rajesh just sent a message. Would be happy to join the bonus spine. So you know, so so actually, Asan is is into spine. You know, I tried to bring him to brain tumor. But you know, there's some problem with him. Uh, you know, so he's not. He's, he will stick with his spine tumor. That's what it looks like. That's so, Essen, <laughs> yeah, Essen, Essen, Essen may stay with us for another year. So, I said, why didn't you do that, buddy? Why didn't you just right. uh, build this up? I mean, and make it make it an international tumor board. So, you know, it you can put in twining, you can put in whatever. You know, just spread it out. Right. Okay. Uh, sir. Once, yeah, once a month, once a month we review cases, uh, and you know. So Umar can be there, and you know uh, Umar and Umar and, and and Mark can do it together, uh, and then you prepare the cases. It's gonna be extra work, I know that. Uh, but hey, you're not married, so you know. Uh, well, they're, they're, I, I announced, I, so I announced that I announced that in the internet. He's not married. <laughs> no, sir, so, that's a great idea. So that's a great idea. I think. Yeah, right. definitely. We should do that. We can work. And Zaim, what about you? I mean, from England, you want to join us on that one? And then we had Fozan and other people also. We can get from people from Latin America also, that Latin right, version. Right, 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 right. And, uh, definitely, definitely, Doctor. That's a, that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. And especially, we have a slightly different view than Americans here in the UK of treating right. most of the things. So. It, it would be a good opportunity to learn to find out what other people are thinking. That's a good idea. Great, great. Okay, okay sir. So it's fine. That was an excellent session. So, so Professor Inam, if you want to add something later, I will ask Dr. Chohan for his final remarks before we end this session. This is this is Chohan's session, you know. Omar, All right, Omar. so Dr. Chohan, please. <laughs> final Dr. words Bilski, before we formally yes. Sir. It's it's always a pleasure. Um, mm. to talk to you, to hear from you. And um, uh, just seeing you brought um, many, many memories from a few years back. Me um, too. Hopefully the next time you're in Memphis, we definitely should, uh, should catch up. Um, uh, thank you so much again for, for coming and uh, giving us the talk. It, it's my absolute privilege. This was amazing. And um, uh, yeah, I'm going to bring you to the big city. We got that taken care of. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all so much. Thank you, Dr. Right. Thank you, you so much. Thank day. you all for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. See. Before we hang up, uh, so, you know, I just want to, uh, I do want to give your email address, uh, Asan. Uh, sure. uh, I'm just going to put my email address in case, you know, somebody wants to uh, do that. And uh, uh, Rajesh, you want to take this? Um, what what I didn't realize was that we we weren't sending um, the uh, the CME certificates. We should be doing that. Right. No, we um, are. We are. I think for, we for, are sending certi a certificate of attendance, sir. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Because somebody wrote in the in, in the chat box that yeah. they're not getting uh, the certificates. I right. think there's, there's a form that they have to fill out. Yeah. yeah. Right. 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 Okay. okay. All right. So let's make that announcement to everybody who's here that there's an evaluation form that needs to be filled after uh, every um, series. And once it's filled, a certificate will be mailed to you. Right. So we did also sir, uh, previously, but yeah, we should. Okay. So in our next session, we can announce that in that intro part also. I will add yeah. that, you know, for I'm all sure. attendees so that they will know. Perfect. Okay. Sir. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Right, Have bye. a great weekend.